If I was a dog, I'd bite. If I was a cat, I'd scratch. If I was a horse, I'd kick. If I was a bird, I'd peck a worm and make it squirm. If I was a lion, I would kill that cub that I had born. And when its eyes my claws had torn, I'd toss my head and laugh, because I knew that I was free. When I am free, don't shake your head. I know I'm dead. She was a most attractive girl because she was intelligent, she was insightful, she was loving, she was responsive. And her anger was genuine, as genuine as her love was genuine. And she had a high sense of justice in many ways. She would say things like, I know I'm awful and I know he's being naughty, but you ought to be kind to him. She was well aware of other people's difficulties as well as her own. She was acutely sensitive to other people's feelings. And she had the kind of longing for what was good that mobilized one's feeling for her. She was a child who touched one very immediately and very deeply. Gail Parsons was only 19 when she died, certain that no one loved her, certain no one cared whether she lived or not, all of us, not just those close to her, derelict basement off the Thames embankment. When Gail retreated here from the world she believed had no place for her, the woman who knew her best, Mrs. Nancy David, had feared the worst. A police message proved her right. Gail Parsons, young heroin addict, was dead. where she was found. Oh, that's horrible, isn't it? Oh. Oh, my God. Had you any idea she was in a place like this? No, I hadn't. And I never knew before, except just that I just got told she'd been found dead. But this is dreadful, isn't it? That, that's it. She would be like that. Why do you say that? Well, she, she wouldn't care. I mean, the last time I saw her, I don't think she would even know. She would be so completely under the influence of drugs. She, it just, she wouldn't know. She wouldn't know where she was. She wouldn't see anything. But you forecast an end like this. I did, and I, I, I you know, really, it's horrifying, but it's just about it. Gail Parsons never had a chance. As a baby, she was unwanted. Her mother put her into a children's home when she was only six months old. And from then on, there was no lasting link with the one woman children need most, a mother. She grew up looked after by one substitute mother after another. She posed readily for the occasional institutional photograph. But at an age when most children are assured of love, young Gail had to fight for her share of affection in a children's home. What she liked best as a little girl were those occasions when she had the chance to be with her mother on a rare outing together. Gail was proud at moments like this when her mother stood beside her. Most of the time, young Gail lived with 250 other boys and girls separated for one reason or another from their parents and put away in one of Britain's biggest welfare institutions, Beach Home, a kind of children's town offering as much help and hope as this kind of artificial life can muster. The one man in her life, she was illegitimate and never knew her father, was the principal of Beach Home, Geoffrey Banner. Did he try to get the mother and child together again outside the institution? Oh, all the time. And certainly when, after she'd reached us at the age of nine for the first time, uh, this was happening uh, all the time. I interviewed the mother regularly and one tried to adjust the mother's attitude to the child so that they could come together. There was not a, la not a great deal of real contact between them. What do you mean by adjusting the mother's attitude? Well, uh, the mother was unrealistic about the child. She was much more concerned with uh, superficial things, like the way she spoke, the way she ate, the clothes she wore. When, in point of fact, we were much more concerned about relationships between the mother and the child. Well, what sort of things did you say to the mother to try and affect this reconciliation? Well, I, I would say to her, never mind about what she wears. This is important in the long run, but it isn't important at the moment. The real important thing is that 
you've come to visit her and that she feels that you care about her. At the moment, she doesn't think you care. And the more you talk about superficial things, like what she eats and the way she wears and the way she speaks, um, she is not likely to feel that you really care. But how important did you feel uh, w was the need for the link between the mother and the child? I mean, did you really try hard to do this? Oh, very. Well, it's absolutely essential. You see, here was a child who was likely to break away from contact and reject the mother altogether. She believed in her heart, subconsciously, that the mother had already rejected her. And if the truth be known, she probably had. And therefore, it was, if we were to have any sort of future, we had to maintain this contact. But it wasn't easy, on either side. Gail's mother went to her daughter's funeral, but for the last 15 months she hadn't even known where Gail was. She feels that people will blame her for the circumstances that led to her daughter's death more than any of the other factors, and she still finds it easy to believe that everybody else was to blame but her. And because it was not our purpose to apportion blame, we disguised the mother's identity in an interview when this film was first shown. But since then she's decided she doesn't even want to be seen again, and we've respected that wish. She herself went to a public school, and she's quick to blame the children's homes for the life Gail later led. For by the time Gail was 11, she was so disturbed she needed the help of a special school. It was one of 14 institutions she was eventually moved on to. Almost all of her childhood was to be spent behind tall railings or high walls, even behind bars. Mary Evans, her headmistress at that first special school, had extraordinary patience. Gail once bombarded her with bricks. Her victim survived and overlooked the assault. The little girl was impressed, and after that, to the end of her life, she always wanted to look good in Mrs. Evans' eyes. By the time she was about 13, 14, in school, I'm not talking about outside, she was presenting as a much more settled girl with some hope of making a career, and a girl who, instead of wanting a gun, as she did the first Christmas, suggested that I bought her something dainty, suitable for a girl on her second Christmas. She'd made considerable strides. But she was thinking about the future at that time. She did think about the future. And a career. And a career. What did she want to do then? Well, she used to think about being an air hostess, not in the way girls do for the glamour, because she thought it would get her to America and she might find her father if she went to America because she thought her father was an American and she wanted to find him. But in a more realistic way, she and I discussed her working with small children in children's homes and we had a lot of inter interesting discussion about how she would treat them, what sort of an adult, what sort of a loving adult and what sort of a controlling adult she would be. I must say that I felt when she was 14, if only we could, at that stage, have found a boarding school. But you see, it isn't easy to find anywhere for a girl of 14, because obviously the boarding school tends to feel, well, <coughs> we haven't time. And I wasn't thinking in terms of a special school, because I felt she needed a new start with normal girls. But it was back to beach home for Gail. As no normal school was said to be available, she had to be put with children who couldn't be coped with in ordinary schools, and she came under the care of Nancy David, a woman who has a remarkable way with children who, like Gail, can be difficult, easily distressed, abusive, even violent. Clara. Clara, you want to give us a little edge to him? Now, if you get the last one, you can have a toffee apple. Clara. <laughs> Okay, right. Gail didn't have a father of her own. No, she's never known a father. In fact, uh, apart from the odd house father whom she's met and one or two male figures in other establishments where she's been, I suppose I was the only constant male figure. How important do you think you were to Gail? Oh, I think I was very important, actually. Uh, she was ready to reject me from time to time, but I, there was never any doubts that uh, I mattered and that what I had to say mattered. I had some influence with her. But in the end, even you rejected her. Oh, yes, we did, and to our shame. But but why did you do this? Well, we did so because uh, throughout the last period she was here, she was having a very unfortunate effect upon other children, and we saw 
other children going down in the process. And this is a very unhappy dilemma that anybody running an establishment has, that you have to choose sometimes between your need and understanding to, to help the individual and the effect the individual may have upon the group. And unhappily, we reached the point when Gra Gale's influence on the group was unfortunate, to say the least, and very damaging. And unhappily, we had to choose. And we chose to reject her. She was now 16, classed as beyond control and sent to an approved school near Warwick. But they couldn't hold her there either. She used to run away, and each time after she'd been on the run a few days and nights, she'd turn up on Mrs. David's doorstep, cold, hungry, and defeated looking for warmth and comfort and a very different world from the only one she'd known so far. But at home, away from her job at Beach Home, Mrs. David had her own family to look after. Her dog, Blackie, was a favorite of Gail's, and she envied the home life of the Davids, although she thought them above her. But for all that, she knew she'd always be welcome, as long as the law allowed. I took her all the way back to Warwick myself, once, to prove and to her and that she did have somebody and to prove to the other girls in the place that she was not a girl without anybody. And we ma I remember where we made a almost oh, a terribly hot day and we made this long, long journey up the M1. On a lovely afternoon, we arrived in this place in the very late, too late for lunch. And um, this girl and I had got into a reasonable frame of mind to go back. And on arrival, although she was courteously received, she was immediately whipped away and put into solitary confinement. And I was quite appalled about this, that this girl had been taken from me without ceremony, not roughly handled, but quite courteously and cold-bloodedly put into solitary confinement. And after I had taken tea very graciously with a most charming headmistress, whom I felt all the time didn't really subscribe to the system she'd inherited, she took me to say goodbye to Gail. And there she was, upstairs, in an attic room, where there would have been no escape, with nothing in this room but a mattress on the floor and a bucket where she had to go to the toilet. And that, that was it. She was shut in that room with a mattress on the floor and, and a bucket, and that was her punishment. A few months later, Gail was moved on again, this time to a mental hospital. She was placed in a ward with elderly distilled patients, though no one seems to know why. She ran away as fast as her young legs could carry her, back to Mrs. David's house. For one whole week, this girl was here in the house, and uh, neither the approved school nor the mental hospital would accept the responsibility for this girl. Both argued it was the others to remove her, and all the time she was here. Had I not been prepared to have her, she would have been at the mercy of whoever happened, because no one ever on one occasion checked where she was or what kind of a setup she was in. In fact, when eventually uh, a quite high-ranking Home Office official, at the request of the CID, instructed the mental hospital to collect her, they came down here uh, and they said, we had no idea what to expect at all. And in fact, they had come with a straitjacket prepared to have to remove her, and I was very indignant when they came to the door. They said it was 11 o'clock at night, and Gail had been sitting ready to leave since 10 in the morning, and I had packed sandwiches in a Tupperware box for her, and, and I said to her, now when they come, you put coffee out for them and receive them in a proper manner, which she did, and they couldn't believe that this was the girl they'd been sent to collect. A few weeks later, Gail was moved on again to Farringdon House, an approved school where the rules are rigidly applied in isolated South Devon. Dear Mrs. David, I hope you're keeping well as I am. I would have wrote before, but I wasn't allowed to. It's stricter here than it was at Noel Hill. I'm only allowed to write to my mother, really, but as I don't write to her, they let me write to you, and I hope you will write back to me. But I'll quite understand if you don't. I can only write letters on a Sunday, I have been here two weeks, and I haven't had any letters since I've been here. I'm only allowed one parcel a month, no matter how big or small it is. Give my love to the kids at school and Mr. and Mrs. Banner, and please explain that I would write to them if I could. But maybe when I've been here a little bit longer, they may let me. There are 60 girls here, and it's like a farm. 
I remember you once said I would do well on a farm. I think I will get on better here than I would have at Knoll Hill. It was too easy, really. I often think of the little kids in beach haunts. If you have some photos, could you please send me them? Loads of love, Gail. P.S. I hope you haven't forgotten me. Please write back. And I sent the parcel. And it will give, I can remember clearly that it was, I sent it in a Dunlop prim, Primsel shoe box belonging to a child in the orchard. That it had a pair of new Primsels in it. We packed this little box up together with three comics. One of them was Marilyn, one was Mirabelle, and something other or other that she was rather keen on at that time. She was only 16, you see. And um, about two shillings worth of small sweets, you know, the kind of things you get on what I call the penny tray. And I got a letter back from the headmistress saying, in future would I kindly not send such lavish parcels to Gail that in future she should have, she, she had everything she needed. And that in future I was to send things like soap, but under no circumstances talcum powder, because these were all that Gail needed. And I was so shocked. I made up my mind. I, said, I still got that letter. I was so shocked about it that I, I thought, well, here is a grossly deprived girl. A few sweets were a very comforting thing. And this girl who had no background, nobody, you would have thought they would have been so pleased that someone should send a parcel from a place which was a link with her past, which she so desperately needed. But all I got was this chilling and chilly letter. Uh, oh, and the thing which really made me angry about that letter was, and only the better kind of magazine. What do you call the better kind of magazine, the lady? Dear Mrs. David, I had a fight the other day and now I'm locked up for it. I don't know how long I have to stay locked up, but I don't care. They can keep me in here forever and I still wouldn't care. We have to wear the uniform all the time. I'm not allowed to write to Mary, and I bet she will think I've forgotten her. So if you see her, please explain to her that I can't write. No, I'm not working on the farm. I'm in the kitchen. I'm only a red badge, and you have to be a yellow or green badge before you can go on to the farm or gardens. You have to be here at the very least two months before you can have anyone visit you, and at least six before your visitor can take you out. I'm sorry I didn't write last week, but I can only write one letter, and I had to answer my child care officers. I miss you, and I wish I was back at Beach Home. Please give my love to Glenwyn, Mr. David, Blackie, and all at the orchard. Well, please write to me again soon. Loads of love, Gail. P.S. Do you think you could send me some photos of the little ones, as I have been talking about them, and I would like to show everyone what they're like? Right soon, Gail. Her next home, Exeter Prison, waiting to be moved on. This time to Borstal. At Farringdon House, she fought authority and wouldn't give in. In court, they called her grossly undisciplined. Dear Mrs. David, Well, as you can see by the paper I'm using, I'm in Exeter Prison waiting till I go to a Borstal. I guess I knew it had to happen sooner or later, and now it has. I'm really sorry that it has, but I suppose I've just got to face up to it now. I don't know how long I will have to do at Borstal, but I guess it'll be up to me now. Please don't stop writing to me, and please don't disown me, because you're the one person that I really do care about. I haven't had a letter from me lately, but I think Mrs. Drysdale wouldn't let me have any letters from me the last few weeks I was at Farringdon, because I was kept locked up in solitary confinement till I went to court. When I went to court, nobody came on my side, not even my welfare officer. I felt really awful. I was really scared when I first got here, but everyone has been quite all right to me so far, and I feel a lot better now. Well, enough of my troubles. How are they all at Beach Home? How are the little kids in Ash? I wanted to work with children, but I don't suppose I'll be able to now. Still, you never know. How are everyone at Sutton Grove? I hope they're all keeping well. Give my love to Blackie. Loads of love always, Gail. P.S. I miss you very much, and I really am sorry. So please write back to me soon. Gail. Gail was never to see the kids at Beach Home again. 
From Exeter, she went for Borstal training. They moved her on for this to Holloway Prison and put her in a cell. Yeah, I think she's the, the best and most humane care, probably, she had. From the time she left us, was in Holloway. I really believe that that was the happiest and the most humane patch after she left Beach Home. The girl whose ambition had been to look after children was now locked up with the women who were later to introduce her to drugs. But Gail knew nothing of the danger at the time. Dear Mrs. Davis, thank you very much for your two letters. I didn't know that you'd been to Czechoslovakia. Why didn't you write and tell me? I was ever so worried. You know what I'm like, always think the worst. It's not too bad here, not half as bad as I thought it was going to be. In a way, it's better here than it was in Farringdon. Anyway, I can have people visit me here and I can have anyone write to me. I've just been sticking pictures on my wall. I've got some great ones of Twiggy. If you can, I hope you will come and see me while I'm in here. I don't suppose my mother would want to come. Love to Blackie. Loads of love, Gail. P.S. Write soon. I miss you very much. Well, she came out of prison on her 18th birthday, and she came into London on a Saturday with a warrant to travel and 30 shillings from the aftercare people on a Saturday afternoon, went into this hostel. A job had been found for her, and the hostel had been found for her. She'd never seen either. She met their friends who had been in Borstal with her, and one of them happened to be a drug addict. She had been found a job at the Petro Public and was due to start work at night. These girls said, oh, don't go to work tonight, your first night out and so on. You come up to Piccadilly with us. And this girl went up to Piccadilly and there she was given drugs. She told me this herself many times since, that on that night, these friends gave her drugs, heroin, mainly. And she returned to the hostel the next day and she was turned out of the hostel along with her friend on the grounds that they would not keep drug addicts. And they left and they began to sleep in Piccadilly. And they began to live there and take drugs from people who gave them drugs. And within a matter of three weeks, at this very crucial time, no one knew who she, where she was. No one knew anything about where she was. I used to think about it. But I don't think anyone was caring. I know no one was caring because she was only a name to the probation officer. How could she be caring about someone who really was hard only on the fringe of an enormous caseload?